thing going on and then preach to us. Okay. Well, we're grateful to be here for another service. I had a good time with the nine o'clock crowd and uh, seeing some uh, faces that I hadn't seen in some time. Uh, we were scheduled to leave on the 31st, and uh, I sent out an update just the other day. Uh, Delta canceled our tickets, and so that has been delayed again. Uh, and so if you're asking when, uh, you know as much as we know when we're going to get to leave. I don't know. And so we're still waiting. Argentina has extended their border closure until the 31st of January. Uh, we are trying. There is a loophole that we can potentially uh, uh, try to do. Argentina is allowing for us to apply for our visas at the consulate in Atlanta, but in order to do that, we have to get special permission from Migraciones in Argentina. And uh, so the guy in Argentina that handles our paperwork has to request the special permission, uh, and he has to somehow show that it's urgent for us to get there. And so that's the trick, isn't it? Is trying to convince a country that they can't survive without us. Uh, so for them to be able to give us that special permission so that we can apply for our visas here, it's, it's not very hopeful, but uh, I do know the one that's in charge and he can move the hearts of all men to do whatever he wills. And so we are, we're trying to, to, to go that route to see if that's a possibility. Uh, if it's if not, then you know we still rest in the knowledge that it's all in His perfect timing, and so we'll get there when He intends us to be there. But we are we are working very diligently. We're trying every avenue that we can. We want to exhaust everything that we can do, humanly speaking, in order to get there so that we can get busy. Um, and so that's that's catching you up on everything that we know. We had started packing again. Uh, this this is the third time that we've packed and unpacked. This time we're not unpacking. We're keeping it packed, and we're going to live off of what we already have out. And so, uh, but we are about halfway packed. Our house in Argentina is halfway set up. Uh, we have a vehicle waiting on us. We have some furniture waiting on us. We have a lot of things that, uh, since March, we have a house that we've been paying for and all of that. And so uh, we're just as anxious to get there as I'm sure you are to see us get there. So just uh, continue praying with us over the next several weeks that, that something will change. Um, one of the things I was uh, excited to get, I got an email the other day from the uh, uh, Veterans Affairs Office saying that they were rolling out some uh, vaccines for veterans coming up and that, you know, go to the VA clinic, you might be able to get uh, immunized uh, for COVID, which I think might help uh, if we can make sure that the whole family gets it. So that's something that we're, we're looking into as well. But just be praying with us. We, we desperately want to get to the field so that we can start learning Spanish and get involved in ministry down there and, and becoming as Argentine as we possibly can. Um, take your Bibles for a few moments this morning. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. When we came back on furlough in March of last year, which is crazy, we were only supposed to be here until January of this year. That was the original plan. And then, of course, in April, South Africa rejected our visas, and uh, we couldn't go back there, so we uh, started taking steps to go to Argentina, and uh, we had extended our furlough only by three months uh, in order to raise the additional funds that we needed to offset the cost of living increase from South Africa to Argentina. And uh, the Lord provided that and brought in the funds for that. And then we were scheduled to leave March 31st. And then that all too familiar saying, and COVID happened. And uh, so that has thrown a wrench and all of that over the past year. But when we first got back from furlough, I and I don't expect any of you guys to remember this, but I preached a message out of Philippians 4 called Lessons from the Mission Field. And uh, two of those lessons was, number one, we, we have to learn to control our thoughts instead of our thoughts controlling us. And then lesson number two was we need to learn to expect nothing and be grateful for absolutely everything. And those were the two lessons that uh, that God really helped me to, to learn, even though I'm still, there's times in my life that I'm still having to learn those lessons. Uh, but while we're on the mission field, this morning I want to preach a message, lessons that God is teaching me through COVID. Uh, you know, this whole year, uh, we have a lot that we can honestly, that we could complain about. Amen or no? 
I mean, there's a lot of plans that we've made that didn't go our way. And if we were real honest, the, the human side of us, we're pretty justified at sitting back and just complaining. Now, the spiritual side of us, we have absolutely nothing to complain about because everything is a gift from God and we don't deserve any of it. But humanly speaking, we could complain about a whole lot. But you realize that there's been some pretty amazing things that God has happened throughout this year. I mean, there are uh, families that have been added to the church. There are souls that have been saved. There, in spite of all of this, there are still missionaries being sent around the world preaching the gospel. Uh, you can read prayer letter, prayer letter after prayer letter and see the work of God has not stopped around the world. And to God be the glory for all of that, in spite of all of the things that would hinder us that may throw a wrench in our plans, God is still at work in the lives of people around the world. And so this morning, I just want to share with you three lessons that God's taught me during COVID. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul starts off with a warning uh, to the church. He says, listen, I want you to be aware of some things. He says... Uh, inevitably, there's going to come uh, division in the church. There's going to be false prophets to try to steal away your disciples. There's going to be division. There's going to be confusion. There's going to be, he calls them dogs. He says in verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers. There's sometimes, there's people in the church that their sole purpose there is to disrupt all of the work of God that they can. And I mean, Jesus, who had 12 men that he poured his life into, had one that betrayed him that was a traitor. And so it should be no surprise to us when we have Judases in our life and ministry. And so Paul warns the church, he says, I want you to beware of these things. It means that to be on guard, be on the lookout. There's some times that you have to mark and avoid some of those people uh, that would be, con uh, be coming in and causing division and contrary to the scripture. And then he goes on, he says in verse 3, for we, are of the for we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and in rejoice in Christ Jesus, and notice this, and have no confidence in the flesh. Can I just tell you that there's no amount of talent or ability that you have in and of yourself. Everything that you do and anything that you're even halfway good at is a gift from God. And we have no confidence in our own abilities. The Bible is very clear to say that wherever the word goes, that it will not return void. That the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And it doesn't matter who the mouthpiece is that's proclaiming it. It's the word that does the work in the hearts of those who hear and receive it. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that he could cause the rocks to cry out, but he chose us. The th truth of the matter is, is that we don't have to do this. We get to. We don't have to be the mouthpiece that God has chosen to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost in the world, but we get to be a part of it. When's the last time that you were framing up a house and, 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 and the hammer got to take credit for the work? I see a bunch of hammers in here. We're just the tool in the hand of a mighty God. And we get to be a small part of His redemptive plan to draw men into Himself. And Paul says, listen, don't have any confidence in the flesh. And then he goes on to explain his spiritual resume. He says, if anybody has a right to brag, I'm more. He said, I labored more abundantly than they all. He said, if you want to talk about somebody that fits the criteria of what it means to be righteous, he said, I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. He said, if anybody has the spiritual resume to, to lay out in front of you, he said, I check all of those boxes. But notice what he says here in verse 7. He says, what things were gained to me, I, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Notice this, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. You know what he's saying? He says, guys, I want you to understand, I might have a whole lot, humanly speaking, that I can brag about. All the other ones might look at me and say, he is the example of apostleship. 
He is the example of what it means to be a preacher of the word. He may set the standard. He said, but all of that was counted but loss. Because I have no confidence in the flesh. Then we come over here to verse 10. And Paul shares his heart with the church. He says, in spite of all of that, he said, all these things that have happened to me, I counted but lost. He says, by the way, in chapter 1, he says, all these things that have happened unto me happened for one sole purpose, for the, uh, uh, for the preaching of the gospel. He said, all of these things have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Every bad thing that's ever happened to me, every trial that I've ever been through, every shipwreck, every beating, every imprisonment, all of that happened for one sole purpose, and that's to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. In verse 10, he says, here's, here's my heart, church. Here's what I want you to understand that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. Hey, aren't you glad for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Aren't you glad that our Savior didn't stay dead and defeated in the tomb? But three days later, by the same power that He had to lay His life down, that same power picked it back up again and He lives forevermore. Jesus Christ is the uh, is the all-powerful one, and death could not hold him, and the grave could not keep him. He said, I glory in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And notice this, and the fellowship of his sufferings. You know what's amazing to me is that many times in my life, I don't have a problem following Jesus. There's times that I can even follow Jesus have a very near and dear relationship with Him, an intimate relationship, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of trial. There's times we, uh, uh, in the military, we had this, this saying, and, uh, and, and I found it to be true, especially for deployments and things like that. You can do anything for five minutes. If you can do anything for five minutes, then you can do anything... For five hours. If you can do anything for five hours, then you can do anything for five days. There's another saying is, if we can get through today, tomorrow's a new day. And so we take it one day at a time. You know how you get through a year-long deployment in a war zone? One day at a time. Just one day at a time. You know, there's times in our life where we can just pull, tighten up our bootstraps, put on our man britches, and tough it out. There's times that we go through trials and just by sheer uh, force and will that we can get through it. But I wonder how many of us would hold to that same sort of intimate relationship, that closeness that we desire in the midst of our hardships, if it was in the midst of his sufferings. You see, Paul wanted to know Jesus Christ in such an intimate way that it was beyond his own trials. It was beyond his sufferings. He wanted to know Jesus Christ so deeply, so intimately, that it was in his sufferings. What were his sufferings? He had the beard plucked from his chest, from his face. He had his clothes stripped from his body, exposed for all to see. They cast lots to see who would get his garments. He had placed upon his brow a crown of thorns and an inscription written over the cross that said, The King of the Jews. He was nailed to that cross. He suffered. He bled. He was stabbed with a spear in his side. And for hours of agony, he hung to pay a debt that you owed. And I think that many of us don't have a problem following Jesus. As long as it's within our realm of comfort. But how many of us would continue to follow Jesus if it meant his sufferings? Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. 
and to die is gain. He said, I'm in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Jesus, which is far better. Nevertheless, it's more needful for you that I abide here in the flesh. Why was it more needful for the Apostle Paul to stay here instead of being with Jesus, which he desired more? It was because he had the words of life and of death. He had the words that would redeem mankind to an all-sufficient, all-knowing creator of the universe through the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, it's more needful that I abide here in the flesh because I have everything that you need. He says that my greatest desire is that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. Notice this, being made conformable unto His death. You know, that sets a pretty high standard for us to live by, doesn't it? There's times where I look at this passage and I think, Lord, there's absolutely no way I could ever live up to that. There's no way that I could live the sort of life that the Apostle Paul exemplified for us. Here's lesson number one. You ready? Neither could he. Notice what he says. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, verse 12, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, for that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Lesson number one, you ready? I haven't arrived. And that's okay. Can I take some pressure off of you this morning? Paul said, I'm not perfect. I haven't fully achieved the epitome of the Christian life. You know what? That's okay. I'm following after it. I'm chasing it. I can see it. Jesus Christ set the example. He exemplified it. He set the standard. And so that's what I'm reaching for. But I haven't arrived yet. And you know what? That's okay. It's been said that the Christian life, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And that when we focus on the end result, then oftentimes we forget to live throughout the process. You see, we got to stop chasing for the product and just live the process. The life that you're living right now, we are in the process of becoming conformed into the image of Christ. Just because you aren't as far down the road as you would like to be or you think you should be, doesn't mean that you're not in the process of becoming more like Jesus Christ. You understand that true perfection, we won't have a perfect body, we won't have a a sinless life until we are standing before Him face to face and we have achieved that perfection. But only in the presence of God do we ever reach that place. One day we're going to have a new body. One day we're going to live outside of the presence of sin. But in this mortal life, we are living through the process of becoming like Christ. Paul said, I haven't arrived. That word apprehended, it means to grasp, to to achieve, to attain. He said, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. You see, this Christian life is a process. And so we live one day at a time. And if we are just a little bit more like Jesus tomorrow than what we are today, we can call that progress. It's all right that you don't have all the answers. Can I tell you, it's all right that if somebody quotes a scripture, you may not know exactly where that came from. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you one. It's okay that you, it, you still struggle to find the minor prophets in the Bible. <laughs> but as long as we're growing, as long as we're reaching for that fellowship with Jesus Christ, we look at a man like Paul and we think, if we could just be like him, but here in chapter 3 he says... I have not arrived. And I'm not perfect. 
For somebody like me, that gives me great hope that God can still use my life. Somebody say amen right there. Lesson number one, we haven't arrived. And that's okay. You know what happens when we put these expectations on ourselves that we'll never be able to achieve? One of two things, either we'll get so discouraged that we quit altogether and we throw up our hands and we say, what's the use? And we walk away and we fall by the wayside. Or we get so puffed up with pride, a false sense of pride, that we begin to put those same expectations on everybody else. And let me tell you something about expectations, is that nobody's going to live up to what you expect out of them. You can't even live up to your own expectations. You've got to be all right knowing that regardless of where you are in your spiritual maturity and your walk with the Lord, that you have not arrived. Now, that doesn't mean that we sit back and we give up and we stop following after because Paul was very clear. and He said, I follow after these things. My desire is that I become more like Jesus and I know Him more intimately. So whatever I need to do, if I need to be more in the Word, if I need to pray more, if I need to serve more, if I need to get the spotlight off of myself and put it on someone else and serve them, I want to follow after those things. But it takes great pressure off of us when we understand that until we close our eyes in death or hear that trumpet sound, we have not arrived. Lesson number two, you ready? We can learn from our experience. Let's be careful not to live in the past. Now, I'd love nothing more than to put this year behind us. It's had its roadblocks, it's had its challenges. And if we can just go ahead and skip forward just a few more days, we're almost out of it. But can I just tell you, just because we get out of 2020 doesn't mean that 2021 is going to be any better. But if we're still living way back in this year and we're sitting here having a pee party for all the things that went wrong in this year, then you know what we're not doing? We're not looking ahead into what God could do in the next year. Can I tell you, some of you, some of you are still holding on to the failures of your past. You know what? You messed up. I don't know how you messed up, but you messed up. We all did. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. Can I just tell you that all of you, at some point in time in your life, you were born into this world a sinner already because by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. You've all messed up at some point in time in your life. The problem is, is that some of you can't get past it. And so instead of trying to get past it and move forward and your life count for the Lord, you've thrown your hands up in the air and you said, you know what? It's not worth it. You got to let go of the past. You got to let go of your past failures. One of the great things that we have in the Christian life is we have opportunities to do right the next day. I'm thankful this morning for a God of multiple chances, aren't you? When I fail Him today, I get a whole new day tomorrow to make it up. Because that's the grace of God on my life. And even if I don't, guess what? Because of Jesus Christ, I've already been declared righteous in His sight. And so I'll stand before Him face to face. And I just won't even think about it at all when I get to heaven. You can learn from your experience we got to stop living in the past. Hey, not only do we need to get past our, our, our failures, we also can't hold on to our successes. Can I tell you one of the dangers that are going to keep the churches here in the United States from going forward in this next year? When we look back and we keep talking about the good old days. My friend, can I just tell you that the baptism waters that stirred 10 years ago, they cannot be sufficient for today. 
The souls that came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because of the ministry of Newton Baptist Church cannot be sufficient for today. There is a world that is lost and they are dying without Christ and every time the clock ticks, there's more that are burning in eternity in in a place called hell and one day the lake of fire. We cannot be satisfied with what God did 10 years ago. We must keep pressing forward. Notice what he says there in verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before. I haven't arrived, and that's okay. I'm glad that we live through the process of, the, of being like Christ and that we don't have to be expected to be perfect. We can learn from our experiences the good and the bad, but we can't live in the past. We must keep pressing forward. And then last but not least, there's still a race to run. So for some of us in here, it's time to get running. We've sat here for too long. We have our place on the pew. Our thumbprints are in our Bibles. We know exactly where to turn in the songbook. But we've been sitting in the same spot for many, many years. And though we may look like we're in the race... We haven't even began running. There's still a race to run. And we have to get running. One day, if death doesn't call us home, then we will hear that shout from the voice of the archangel, followed by a trumpet. And we will see the dead in Christ rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be called up in the air, to, and so forever shall we be with the Lord. We will be raptured out of here. But until that day, there is a race to run, there are souls at stake, and we need to get running. There's enough excuses out there to keep everybody sidetracked, but we can't allow them to keep us down. It's time for us to get up. It's time for us to get going. Because until death takes us, we have a job to do. Verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's a race to run. And regardless of your faults, regardless of your failures, regardless of how good you thought you were years ago, your race isn't over yet, so get running. I remember the story of a man named Clifford Albert Young. He was a farmer in Australia. And uh, it was 1970s and Australia was getting ready to host their very first ultra marathon. This race was going to consist of five days and roughly 544 miles that these runners from all over the world were going to come and run. The day of the race, all these runners gather around and they've got their high-tech tennis shoes and their shorts and their tank tops and their uh, sponsors all over their their clothing and they're they're geared up to run this ultra-marathon that's going to last for this whole five days. And, I mean, they've been training for years and years and years. And the day of the race, Clifford Young shows up in overalls and work boots. Be like seeing some of you guys show up on race day. And Clifford Young comes up to the the race line, and all those other runners that have been training and preparing for some time, uh, they, they look at him and they just start laughing. They think, what in the world is this guy doing here? There's no way he's going to be able to last an entire day. Why is he even here? Well, the race begins and all those runners take off. They leave Clifford Young in a cloud of dust. But Farmer Young, with his overalls and work boots, takes off at a slow and steady pace. 
After a day of running several miles, the runners, they pull off to the side of the track and they begin setting up their camp and preparing their meals and uh, they eventually fall asleep and rest up for the next day's run. What they didn't anticipate was that Farmer Young, all through the night, would continue running that slow and steady pace. Next morning, those runners get up. They didn't see Farmer Young, and so they thought he had already quit and dropped out of the race. They stretch, they take their time, they get back on the track, and they take off again. Several hours down the road, they catch up to Farmer Young, and they're all astonished, they're amazed. They cannot believe that all night long that he continued to run. That next day comes to an end, and they've passed him by several hours, and they pull over to set up their camp, have a hot meal, and get a night's rest before they continue the next day. And again, all night long, Farmer Young continues to run. By the end of the five days, the runners get to the end where Clifford Albert Young had beat them by a total of 10 hours. The news reporters are there and they start to interview him and they say, how in the world were you able to run for five days and five nights straight without stopping and resting? And Farmer Young responded to him. He said, all of my life I've lived here. I've been a sheep farmer. For as long as I can remember. And every year during the storm season, I have to run after my sheep and gather them up to protect them from the storms. He said, I just imagined that I was chasing my sheep to protect them from the storm. My friend, can I remind you? That Jesus looked out over the multitudes and it says that he was moved with compassion because he saw them as sheep having no shepherd. And all around this world, there are souls that are lost and dying without Jesus Christ. And there is a storm on the horizon. It's called eternity. And if they die lost without Christ, their eternity will be forever in the lake of fire. The media asked Farmer Young, they said, well, what are you going to do with the prize money? Back then it was $10,000, which today would have been the equivalent of about $50,000. Farmer Young looked back at him and he said, I didn't even know there was a prize. You know what astonished me was what he said next. He said, All these other guys have trained and prepared so much for this race. He said, I think I'll just split it equally among them all. My friend, can I remind you? At the end of our race, there is a prize. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, but not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. At the end of our race, there is a prize. At the end of our race, I long to hear those words, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over few things. I'll make you ruler over many. I haven't arrived. And that's all right. Because I'm sure enjoying the journey. I've I've made some mistakes in my life. I've also had some successes. Boy, I've seen God do some amazing things. And while I can look back on those and be encouraged and challenged, I can't live on the good old days. I can't live in my past. There's still a race to run. 
And until we close our eyes in death and see Jesus face to face, we got to keep pressing forward. Father, we love you. Lord, we love this church. I pray, God, that you'd encourage them, that you'd challenge them. Lord, I don't know all the things that they're facing right now, but Lord, I know that you do. And I just pray, God, that you would uh, comfort their hearts even this moment. Lord, help us to remember that this life is a process and we're constantly being conformed into your image. And God, I pray, Lord, that we would not hold to our past failures or successes, but Lord, we would keep reaching forward. And Lord, maybe it's, maybe it's said of us that we've been sitting out the race for too long. Lord, help us to get up and get running. Lord, we know that there's a storm on the horizon. Lord, we know that there are sheep that are scattered abroad having no shepherd. God, I pray, Lord, that we would be busy to round them up to protect them from that storm, knowing that at the end of this race, not only do we have a crown to look forward to, but we have your approval. God, I pray, Lord, that we would live our lives for the furtherance of the gospel. We love you and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.